Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Alan Deal. I'm currently the president of the Interreligious Council of Lynn County. On this morning's show, we're going to discuss the question, do we have a population problem? And here to discuss this mysterious and interesting uh, question, I have two distinguished panelists. And before we jump into the topic, I would like you to uh, briefly introduce yourself. Good morning. I'm Sylvia Secchi. I'm an, a professor in the Geographical and Sustainability Sciences Department at the University of Iowa. I am also a Iowa State University graduate in their economics program. So I look at these issues of population uh, or overpopulation uh, through a lens of sustainability, natural resources, um, and various development issues associated with population across, across the planet, really. Thank you, Sylvia. Hi, my name is Mary Noonan, and I am a professor in the Sociology and Criminology Department at the University of Iowa. Um, I study issues related to gender, work, and family. And in particular, I'm interested in how family responsibilities impact um, women's success in the workplace, um, and uh, specifically how family responsibilities affect men and women differently. Um, I'm interested in this topic um, Number one, I was trained as a social demographer, which is basically somebody who studies population issues um, with a sociology um, perspective. Um, in particular, I'm interested in women's fertility and why and uh, how they choose whether or not to have children, how many children, and how this impacts um, their success at work. Well, thank you both. And I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation here. So to kind of kick things off, um, I thought about this topic a while back and I've had just a variety of kind of micro conversations with different people. And I just ask them the simple question, uh, do we have a population problem? And uh, typically you get uh, two major responses. One is, no, I don't think we do. I think we're fine. Or yes, we do, and I say why, and they say, well, we just have too many people on the planet, right? Um, but rarely do I get the response that we ha don't have enough people on the planet. And we're gonna certainly talk about all of those above scenarios, right? But we, I, I really do wanna hone in on you know, this idea of underpopulation. But before we go there, I wanna get your, both of yours opinion on that question. Uh, do you, consider there to be a problem around population? What do you think that is? Either one of you. <clears throat> Either one can go at it. Uh, how about this? I'll choose you. Mary, can you, can you get us going? I would probably answer the way most of your um, friends or people that you've spoken to um, do. And if I had to choose one, I would probably say overpopulation. Um, I think the effects of humans are obvious. Um, when the population is too large for the available resources we have, um, there's negative consequences, um, energy shortages, um, famine, disease, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously um, with underpopulation, we also have negative consequences. Um, we need young people to work and pay for the medical care of the previous generation. Um, and with underpopulation that we see um, specifically in some Western European countries, Japan, um, there's an increasing financial and physical burden on young people to, um, to take care of the elderly. So I certainly don't think that underpopulation comes with no um, negative consequences. Thank you. Sylvia, do you have a thought? Well, I kind of have a different take. Um, I think of this issue of population over or under as kind of like being uh, the tip of the iceberg. And the real issue we face on this planet is the uneven distribution of resources. Population challenges are just one of the symptoms of this underlying problem, which is structural and historical. So what we have now in the world is we have 
a global north, which is aging and shrinking, but also has hoarded resources through a history of capitalism, colonialism, globalism, all those isms, right? So we are the well-off and we're shrinking. And then we have the not so well-off uh, for very historical reasons that are connected directly to us being well-off who um, are still growing. And so when we look at that imbalance in world populations and the different speeds, right? So what we're seeing is, yes, everybody's going down. The world population uh, growth is going down, but it's going down at different speeds, right? And so if you go down too fast, you may have a pretty hard landing, right? Um, and so what I think is happening here is that we are seeing this symptom of a larger problem of inequality and different distribution of resources and different uh, over utilization of resources. In the United States, in North America, in Italy, where I am from, we are more than using the resources we have at our disposal, while places that are growing faster uh, than we are, uh, places like Sub-Saharan Africa, are vastly um, inferior in their per capita use of resources. And so I think that the population issue is just one of the symptoms of this global inequality that we need to address the root of the problem if we really want to move forward as a, a planet. <clears throat> yeah, and I think you're, that's an interesting point, uh, Sylvia. And I think it is, um, you know, based on what I've read, yeah, it's certainly true, right? That that uh, there it, it is, it does vary throughout the, uh, the world, population growth and decline. And it does, whether a, a country, if you will, can sustain their population or deal with that, if you will, does depend upon their resources, right? So coming back to you, Mary, um, how, how do you think we should, you know, in light of what Sylvia just brought up there, um, do you see, again, the greater threat being um, just, just fundamentally overpopulation? Or do you think that there is a solution to that and our focus should be more on uh, not necessarily worrying about a population decline or, or, gro or growth per se, but how we could leverage our resources, our technology, our governments, et cetera, to address those problems. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything that Sylvia said. She's um, spot on with respect to the, the global north and global south and inequality with respect to resources and differences in population growth. Um, I think that, um, from a societal perspective, certain countries are concerned with low population, like Italy or Japan or even the US. They're concerned that the population age structure is such that there's going to be problems in the future if the fertility rate continues to go down. And so um, I don't I, I I don't know if we want to talk about um, country specific problems yep. or um, global problems. Well, because then I think in other countries, women maybe have more children than they ideally would like to have because um, they have uh, they don't have access to reproductive health care. No, I think it's a good segue, right, yeah. to help narrow the conversation because this could go, you know, in a variety of different ways. So, if we look at the fertility rate, right, which is the number of, you know, uh, 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 children that a, an a individual woman is, is having, right. um, to, to maintain your population, it needs to be roughly 2.1 per per woman, right, right. in your society. Uh, right now in the United States, it's at about 1.76 and has is, and is dropped off significantly over the last 10 years. Um, so that, to your point, I think, Mary, you're the one that brought it up. I mean, this, this does raise, and then there's other countries, obviously, that have, have even a greater decrease, but this does raise a concern about how do you support your older population, right? As they age, who pays for the, or who, who, uh, who's the nurses? Who's the doctors? Who builds the roads? Who are your police officers? All the way down the line, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's a concern for governments to make sure that they encourage their their um, their population to continue to have children. But how do you think, and maybe we'll come back to you, uh, Sylvie, on this one, how do you think we best address, if at all, uh, the question of declining fertility rates here in the United States? Well, I, I kind of think that it's funny that you asked me this question because this is a nation of immigrants, right? And so if you're a nation of immigrants, you already know what the solution is. The solution is immigration. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the fact that it's such a contested topic, right, to uh, increase immigration uh, is, is, is not necessarily due to purely economic reasons and there's deeper uh, uh, 
you know, uh, deeper and more problematic um, uh, roots to the opposition to immigration in the United States. Uh, but I think a country like my country, like Italy, and a country like the U.S., uh, you know, opening up to immigration uh, in uh, is, is the solution, and that the problem becomes, you know, that you have xenophobia and you have racism and you have all these other issues. But clearly, to rebalance that population pyramid, right, in ways that make it more um, capable of sustaining uh, the the aging population, you know, that don't destroy social security, the solution is to increase immigration in a, um, reason a reasonable manner, while at the same time decreasing the pressures that you see at the borders in the United States, just like in Europe, right, through the Mediterranean, by having policies that improve the quality of life and well-being uh, of people who live in the global south. So it's a um, all of the above kind of solution, in my opinion. And Mary, do, do you agree with that immigration is is the key, or do you think there needs to be a broader, uh, more more holistic approach to? I, I think most of the experts on this topic um, agree with Sylvia and say that more immigration is needed to accelerate population growth. And um, I think it's it's a question of whether U.S. policymakers can actually overcome their political differences on the issue to make it an effective tool. Um, it could be accomplished in a number of ways by you know increasing the caps on existing forms of legal immigration, you know visas and green cards. Um, uh, but all different types of immigrants are important. I think workers are important. I think family members are important to ensure that immigrant populations feel comfortable putting down roots in the U.S. and having children. And those children of immigrants will be a major driver of population growth in the long term. So I think um, uh, immigration is certainly a key. Um, on the other side, um, you know, if you look at there's this kind of an interesting question that a lot of people who study fertility um, uh, use in surveys, and it's at, it asks women and men what their ideal family size it would be, what their preference is. And um, in developed countries up, across the board, you see that women tend to um, sh um, miss their goals. So they don't have as many children as they ideally would like to have. And so I think at the um, government level, policies certainly could be um, developed to make, um, uh, allow people to better, better um, achieve what they want with it when it comes to their fertility ideals or preferences. I have to say that I agree with that too, because in Italy, we have one right. of the lowest right. fertility rates in, on the planet, right? Right. And, and what is the cause of that? Well, it's a combined thing. So we have a very high unemployment rate and culturally in Italy, you need to have a job and own a house or, you know, have, have a, a house with a mortgage uh, to right. get married. And so what we see is we see people marrying later and later in life. And that definitely has impacts on their fertility, uh, it's becoming more common to have children prior to uh, getting married, but it's not still not the norm. And so I actually, you know, I have several uh, cousins who either ended up not having children or just have one child. Uh, and, and there's a lot of um, women in Italy who are having children in their 40s because it's so difficult to find a job you know, find a find a house that you can afford, an apartment you can afford, uh, while your uh, you know what while your 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 fertility is at its highest, and so the lack of um, support, uh, uh, more 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 specifically regarding uh, reproductive uh, issues, you know, and things related to childcare and so on and so forth are really important, but also the overall health of the economy is important because if you can't find work, that might affect your fertility. And of course, if you can't find work and you can't find childcare, that also will affect your, your decisions regarding how many kids you can have. And I can tell you that, yes, it's, it's pretty bad in the U.S., but it's also pretty bad in Italy in terms of how expensive it is to have a child and how uh, difficult it is to, to uh, you know, grandmothers help a lot in Italy too, you know, because we don't have a, enough uh, state support for, for children. 
Yeah. So th thank you for that. And and I agree that uh, there's there's a variety of ways, and certainly the government uh, incentivizing or making it more uh, appealing, right, to have children, obviously can can play a part. And uh, I was r listening to a podcast on this subject while I was kind of researching it. And one of the they had a a, a couple people that study this and have for for a long time, and they they really hit on a lot of interesting topics. And one of the things they said was. You know, when you really study and do some like meta analysis, right? Analysis of analysis, studies of studies, you 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 can't really target a particular reason why people are having fewer kids, right? Like it seems to be uh, the changing zeitgeist around having children that there seems to be a, you know, just a different view on it, and 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 that can be for a variety of reasons, right? Or when you experience the world for di in different ways, uh, uh, pursue a career, on and on and on. So, you know, that, that being the case, uh, you know, is there, is, is there a way for us to, you know, kind of change people's thinking around having children? Now, and again, this is assuming we consider having, you know, uh, lower fertility rates a problem. We can, we can certainly switch to, you know, the overpopulation side of it. But do you fundamentally see this swinging back to where, you know, in five years where, you know, population is going to be what it was, you know, 1950, you know, yeah. four, four or five uh, children per, per woman? Or do you see this as a pretty sustainable or a pretty consistent fertility rate uh, ongoing? Either one, either you. Well, wants I was I was gonna say that one the way I uh, conceptualize this issue is by using what Amartya Sen um, calls the capabilities approach, and so from my perspective, what we really want to focus on is giving people agency and capabilities, and if they have the choice, right? If they have the um, the, the kind of like the, the money, the resources, the uh, the government programs, uh, the, the 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 power to decide on their own. I think that a lot of these problems will disappear because I think a lot of women will have less children and other women will have more children. Uh, I think that the imbalance that we're seeing it today is because people don't have the agency to make the choices that are best for themselves. And I think that that's kind of like realigning people's agency and particularly women's agency, because we are the ones who bear the biggest costs in many, many ways, right? Of having children with what we really want. If we had job markets that work, if we had childcare um, that we're uh, institutions that are affordable, if we had um, support for people like me, you know, who was in school until uh, I was 32, you know, and so I, I had my kids in my mid to late 30s. Uh, so if we had all these choices available to women, what women would do would be a lot healthier. People in the global north would probably have more children and people in the global south would probably have less children. And so we wouldn't have such a big imbalance that we see today. So again, we go back to this idea that uh, over or underpopulation is really a symptom of, of the lack of power and agency that women have throughout the globe. Okay. So I, I think there's probably some people watching this right now that are like, are you kidding me? Uh, you know, you, you're, you're here talking about how we should encourage people to have more children. M you know, my gosh, there's, there's almost 8 billion people on the planet. Uh, you know, the, the population has exploded quadrupled more than quadrupled, right? Over the last hundred years, uh, 1900, if you're living, there's 1.7 billion people today. Like I said, there's almost 8 billion. And, you know, so I think there's probably going to be a lot of people that, that watch this and say, no, this is a good thing, right? That we're having fewer kids because, you know, we, we don't have a way, you know, and people project there to be 10 billion people on the planet by, by mid-century and then possibly declining based on current fertility rates by the end of the century. But um, when, when, what would be your response to somebody, for instance, that's like, you know, I'm not having more children because I think it's unethical. Uh, given what we're, you know, doing to our world and just the ability to sustain this population, what would be your response? I would say that's fantastic. That's because you are empowered right. to make that decision. And I then somebody else is empowered to make a different decision. 
I don't think that's the main reason people aren't having children or, or aren't having as many children as they did during the 1950s. I don't think it's the environment. I think that some, some people certainly um, might have that perspective that having an additional human um, you know, eats up more resources, but I don't think that's the vast majority. Only about 20% um, of women currently are um, don't have children. And about 10% of those are, and this is in the United States, about 10% of those are doing it voluntarily. So the vast majority of people um, want kids and, um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's more about um, uh, them not having the amount they want. I think some people certainly like, like you said, don't uh, choose to go down the childlessness path because of the environment or for other reasons, they, they value their individual time. Um, they want to pursue uh, various other activities and or their career, but I don't think um, that's that's the majority of people. Sylvia, what, what do you, what's your what's your feeling on it? Yeah, I think you know. For me, I can tell you that um, I wanted to have kids so much that I delayed the beginning of my academic career. So I became a professor. I started in the tenure track when I was forty years old. Um, and I would have started earlier if there had been institutions in place uh, to uh, help me have kids while I was in grad school. But I was, uh, you know, I was uh, uh, living with a, uh, with a money, you know, I was a, an, a, I'm an immigrant, right? So I was, I didn't have a lot of money and, and my husband also didn't have a lot of money. And so we just couldn't afford it. And so I think that, um, what is really important is to give people the tools to make the choice that they want. And I, I just don't think we've seen this now in China, right? Right, That their one child policy was really a failure because now they're concerned that they don't have enough people. Uh, so I, I don't think that having these top down policies that say, uh, you know, you can only have one kid or you can only have two kids. I don't think it's morally um, right i don't I, I don't think the government should do that and i also don't think it works the way you think it works because you, it can have negative consequences so i think giving people the tools to make the choice they want um, the choices they want and uh, making sure in the global south uh, where we're seeing this uh, massive uh, massive uh still you know where we're st still seeing growth what we're seeing is their, their natality rate, so the number of kids they have is still high, right? While their mortality rate is going down. So people live longer. So we're kind of like in a transition phase down there. And then their, their, um, their numbers will go down as well. And we can have a more harmonious population pyramids where the, there's enough youngs, uh, young people to support old people. So here's an interesting question, a little bit out of left field, but we're the interreligious council of Lynn County, right? And uh, so obviously uh, we have a, you know, a, um, so when you study some of this, um, what they find is that uh, there is a positive correlation, right? Between um, how religious uh, an individual is and maybe at a macro level, how religious a country is and their fertility rates, right? There seems right. to be a positive correlation there. So Italy being a great example of, you know, being part of Europe and the overall kind of secularization of Europe, if you will, or the downward trend and kind of affiliation with organized religion. Do you, f and, and then we're, you know, the United States, somewhat mimicking that trend. Uh, do you see that as a contributing factor to, um, you know, our, our declining fertility rates, or do you think that's just a correlation without causation? I think it's, um, I think it's a correlation, not causation. I think, like you said, fertility and faith really kind of travel closely together. Women who describe themselves as, or describe religion as very important in their lives have much higher fertility than women who say religion is not important. But when you look more carefully at why it is that more religious women want more children, most research shows that um, that those who say religion is, you know, very important in their lives have uh, significantly higher or significantly uh, stronger traditional gender and family role attitudes. And basically that that means that they are more likely to agree with the statement, you know, it's best for a man to be the breadwinner or a woman to be the homemaker. 
And so it seems as though these attitudinal differences really account for a substantial part of the association between uh, fertility and faith. And so I think it's less, and I don't know if this is maybe what you were suggesting, but I think it's less that religion than a particular, less that a, re a particular religion, you know, has a, a specific pronatalist orientation. I, I don't think it's um, so much that. I think it's more that people who are religious tend to um, think that um, the women's place is um, um, in the home and the man's role is to be the breadwinner. And that's neither good nor bad, but I think it suggests that these women really think family is important. And we've seen that that gender roles have changed significantly over the last 30, 40 years for a whole host of reasons. Um, and so I really see that kind of what, what women value as probably the, the bigger issue and less, but it's obviously correlated with religion. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a nice summation. Thank you. I, I think we have, we got about three and a half minutes left. And so what I'd like to do is, you know, um, there, there's always uh, dire predictions. Uh, you just turn on the news, read a book. I mean, it's everywhere uh, around, um, you know, the end of the world or over you know, the dangers of overpopulation, uh, the dangers of underpopulation, uh, you know, all kinds of predictions out there. Uh, what what is your what is your feeling generally, or what's your position? Do you tend to be fairly optimistic um, that humanity generally can solve, whether it be an underpopulation problem, right, Sit, solved through you know immigration or whatever you know automation, et cetera, or overpopulation, right, the the, the development of technology to solve for those problems? I, I'd like for us to spend the last maybe couple minutes just talking at a very high level there around. How, how do you approach it? Are you, are you optimistic or do you do you find yourself fairly pessimistic? Well, I'm an educator. So I think by, by construction, I have to be optimistic, right? Because I believe that the next generation, uh, I, I'm training the next generation. I'm, I'm teaching the next generation. So I think what we need to do is we need to be honest about some of the problems we're facing in terms of use of resources and disparate use of resources. Uh, but I, I believe we have the capability of getting ourselves out of these predicaments. Ditto. Yeah, I'm an optimistic person, and uh, I uh, have complete faith that um, the end of the world is not um, coming soon, <laughs> and that um, that the next generation of individuals will will um, be able to solve some of these big social problems that we face. Yeah, and I think there's you know there, there's definitely precedent for that, right? I mean, if again, if I'm living in the early 1970s, I see this just plummeting of, right. of fertility rate, right, from the early 1950s. You know, at the at the rate it's declining year over year, I'm thinking to myself, is there going to be you know people around to do anything? And you know, uh, but you know, it, it obviously wasn't as bad as as people thought. And and from a um, an overpopulation standpoint, right? Again, as I mentioned earlier, if I'm living in the 18th century America. And, and I'm told there's going to be 8 billion people on the planet. And we know there was all kinds of dire predictions about how we'd never, you know, be widespread famine and people dying in the streets. And how the heck could we do this? You know, and the, the big blind spot, obviously, was the advancement in technology, the advancement right. in science and the ability. You know, some of the numbers you read is you've got, uh, you know, we have uh, 20, a 25 percent surplus on the planet of, of, of food. Uh, we have at least what I was researching about the ability to feed about 10 billion people uh, a year. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, if there's any, if the past is any predictor of the future, we're, con you know, we'll continue to advance when it comes to, you know, uh, maintaining our, our uh, managing our, our resources. So I know we just have about 30 seconds left. I, I think we're in, and, and really, I think we're almost done here. So uh, I really appreciate this fascinating conversation. I, I hope it was interesting for people that maybe didn't quite, understand what the, you know, what the debate was, what the problems were. So I appreciate both of your uh, opinions, your expertise that you brought to our conversation this morning. I hope our viewers have a great and wonderful Sunday. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.